Today's the third in a series of lessons entitled Encounters by the Sea. They're leading up to our Easter Sunday worship together where the, the sermon for that day is entitled Out of the Darkness. And these are all coming from the book of Mark and stories in the book of Mark. And they're powerful encounters that Jesus had with people beside the Sea of Galilee. Uh, I, I kind of wanted to start this lesson this morning uh, talking about hungry. And uh, I wanted to start it kind of telling you a little bit about my own life and some things that happened to me. Uh, it, it hardly seems possible now, but over 17 years ago, um, I ended up losing my job. I didn't lose my job. I knew where it was. They just wouldn't let me do it when I went back there. <laughs> um, but in that process, I remember praying to God to find me another job, to find me a job like that one. And it wasn't until I finally prayed the prayer, God, I don't know what you want me to do, but whatever it is, you show me what it is and I'll do that. Now, the way it turned out, it's not the way I had hoped it would turn out. Uh, I can tell you that I was led into a wilderness that we'll talk about in just a minute. And the things that I tell you, the particulars, when I tell people about them, they roll their eyes because they just don't really know if that's how God works. But I believe it is. But this whole lesson is about providence. It's about being hungry and being filled and it happening in the least likely of circumstances. Our first big idea of the day is that we, we rarely um, recognize God's provision until we place ourselves in a position to actually need it. We rarely recognize God's provision until we place ourselves in a position to really need it. You know, sometimes life puts us in this position. Sometimes, because life is expensive, uh, life can be difficult, life can be unpredictable. Because of this expense and difficulty and unpredictability of life, sometimes we get placed in a position where we need God to act because we can't deal with things and can't handle the situation ourselves. However, sometimes we need to place ourselves in these positions. Sometimes we should walk willingly into a place where we know we're going to be hungry and we know only God can feel that hunger. I find it amazing as Christians how many of us believe in a big God. You know, Jake referred to how big our God is, and we, we believe in this big, awesome, awe-inspiring God, the one that spoke a world into existence, who keeps it spinning to this day, yet knows every hair on our head some more than others. And yet, we believe he's a big God who does big things in big ways and told in stories that are big stories. However, we will do anything we can to keep from placing ourselves in a position where we have to depend on him being a big God. We'll do anything we can to avoid actually having to need this God. Let me share something with you. Parents, if that's who you are, if you're the person who, yeah, you tell your children that God's a big God and, and that he can do great things, but you will break your neck not to ever have to be in a position to depend on God being a big God, don't be surprised if someday your children are not going to be interested in your religion. They're not going to be interested in your faith because they really haven't seen you exercise it. You see... It's important that we place ourselves in a position to need God because that's how faith is developed. In all of our lives, we cannot develop our faith, we cannot become people of faith unless we have the courage to step out of our comfort zone and to allow God to be a big God. And that faith is where our story starts this morning. It's, a, it's another story. You saw some of it on the screen in the intro. It's the story of the feeding of the 5,000. But the lessons in this story may not be the lessons that you think are there. For most of us, we read this story and we think, well, that's a cool story. A bunch of people went out on the hillside. God performed a miracle. Jesus turns these loaves and fishes into a bunch of food. Everybody eats and they go home. 
Oh, guys, there's so much more to this story. And it has to do with the development of our faith. So let's pick up this morning in, in Mark chapter 6. And we're going to start reading in verses 30 through 33. The apostles gathered together with Jesus, and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourself to a secluded place and rest for a while. For there were many people coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. And they went away in the boat to a secluded place by themselves. And the people saw them going, and many recognized them and ran there together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. Now, this is a cool scene. What's happened is, is that before this in, in the text, Jesus has sent his disciples out by themselves to, to preach and to teach and to do mission work alone. And what had happened was they come back and Matthew says they reported, even the demons obey us in your name. They're just amazed by what's going on. I mean, I could just see Thomas standing there and saying, you know what I did? I preached a sermon with no notes. It was awesome. And so they're all excited, and Jesus is saying, okay, we've got a crowd around us. We really need to go out, and we need to rest. You see, huge crowds and being pushed in by the crowd was nothing new to the ministry of Jesus. As a matter of fact, it marked the ministry of Jesus. There was always a crowd, and there was always a need, and there was always a hunger. And so his cycle was this. He would give, 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 retreat. Give, 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 retreat. And this is no different. And so in my mind, as I see what's going on, we've got all these disciples and they're all excited and they need some time alone to kind of sort this thing out, to rest. And so they all get in a boat and they go to a secluded place. That's what we're told here. I'm going to talk about that word a little bit in a minute, but they go to the secluded place and on the seashore, they see them leaving. I don't know how many of you ever watched the Andy Griffith show, the old Andy Griffith show. But there was a little boy on the Andy Griffith show named Leon. Anybody remember Leon? He was, in, in real life, it was Opie's little brother. And, and he always had the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and it was always all over his face. And, and in the episodes that Leon is in, it, it, he would just always kind of show up, and he was just there eating his peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And for some reason, when I envision this story, I see Leon standing there eating his peanut butter and jelly sandwich as they're leaving the shore. And he goes back and tells everyone. And then Forrest Gump comes up and does, you know, this. And they realize they're getting away. And these guys are so bad at rowing a boat that the people could go on foot and beat them where they were going. But see, the story is not powerful because the people went on foot. It's not powerful because they were going to find rest. It's powerful because of where they were going. There's a Greek word that's used here, and the word is erimon. He was taking his disciples to a place called Arimon. And, and this word Arimon means deserted, forgotten, or lonely. I want you to think about that for just a minute. In order for Jesus to find rest, in order for his people to find provision, they had to go to a place that was deserted, forgotten, and lonely. And guys, that's our next big idea. You see, the next big idea is those who are serious about following Jesus will eventually be forced to find him in a place of abandonment and surrender. I bet every one of you have been in Arimon. At some point in your life, as God is preparing you to do something amazing, he is taking you to Arimon. When I lost that job, once again, didn't lose it, I knew where it was, but they wouldn't let me do it. He pushed me into a place of Arimon. My own personal wilderness, it wasn't easy, it felt lonely, it was hard, but he was preparing me for to, to do something else, and it wasn't what I wanted to do, it wasn't where I wanted to go, but it was what was best for me at the time. And that's how God works. He takes the people that he has called to do great things, people like you and I, and he allows us to go through this wilderness so that we will develop a hunger so that we will go to a place where we are experiencing need I mean scripture is full of the stories right I mean you remember the story of Elijah and how that he was having this argument with 450 prophets of Baal and they build these altars and fire comes down out of heaven and it laps up his altar proof that the that Jehovah was the only living God do you remember what Elijah did after that 
He got scared and ran, and he went in the middle of a wilderness, and God prepared him for something even greater. You remember Moses? That Moses has found out who he really is, and he's got one foot on the Egyptian side and one foot on the Israel side, and he ends up killing an Egyptian, and what does God do with him? He takes him to the middle of a wilderness to be a goat herder for 40 years to prepare him for something even greater. And my favorite story of all of them, we mentioned this story a few weeks ago, is the story of Abraham. How Abraham was told that he would have a son and this son would be the, the first of, of a many born and that he would be given a promise that his seed would be as numerous as the, seas of the, sa- uh, the, the sands of the seashore. But before he gets that promise, God leads him to this deserted place, this mountaintop, and he says, would you please sacrifice your son to me? And Abraham was faithful. And they went on the mountain, and in the middle of that wilderness, what Abraham needed most was a way out. And God provided it in a thicket in the form of a ram. And while Abraham is on that mountain, before God gave him this amazing promise, Abraham committed an act of faith. In the middle of his wilderness, in the middle of wondering, what in the world is going on with God right here? He says this in Genesis 22, verse 14. Abraham called the name of that place, this mountain that he was on, the Lord will provide, which is Yahweh Jireh. As it said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. First thing I want you to see is this. That when when God leads us to a place of desertion, look out, he's about to show up. And something amazing is about to happen. And we need to realize that God uses the wilderness in our lives to prepare us for great things, just like he would use the wilderness in this story. As he led these people out, he would teach them on this mountaintop, but the lesson they would learn would be more than anything that he would say. It would be what they would witness him doing. So the second part of this story is, we we continue on with it in verse 34. And we read verses 34 through 38. It says, when Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it was already quite late, his disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate once again. This is Eremon. And it is already quite late. So send them away so that they may go into a surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. Once again, they had just come back from doing amazing things in the name of Jesus. They were all excited and now they're back to being themselves. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread, giving them something to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go look. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. Now, I know you're sitting there wondering, okay, what's he going to do with that? Where's this going? Well, the first part of this, le- this, this segment is he talks about these people, and he looks at them, and he has compassion on them like a, uh, they were like sheep without a shepherd. And I don't know if he thought of this, but I know I thought of it when I read that in Scripture, that... The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. As he had led them into the middle of nowhere, just like a shepherd would lead sheep into the middle of nowhere, he said they were like sheep without a shepherd, and they needed someone to lead them, and they needed someone to provide for them. And he was going to make sure that when they left this place, they would know that he was that shepherd. And then the story continues on. The disciples say, not enough food. You see, the disciples have this attitude, and it's an attitude that you and I have sometimes. It's an attitude of scarcity. You know, sometimes we're in the middle of this wilderness, we don't know if God's going to act, and we don't think that there's going to be enough, and we don't see a way out. And so often, we forget that God is the great provider. But you see, the disciples couldn't see this. And so what's their first response? Well, send 
these people away. Well, why was this their first response? That's the question we have to ask. We know they've come across. We know that they were trying to get away from a crowd that they wouldn't get away from. And now they're hungry and they're saying, send them away. Why would you do that? Because their expectation of what Jesus could do was so low that they truly did not expect Jesus to do anything. And sometimes we're guilty of the same thing. Now we talk about this big God who does big things in big ways. But when push comes to shove, we really don't expect Jesus to work in our life in any meaningful way. Oh, step out on faith, they say. Well, yeah, but man, I just don't know if I can do that. Let me do whatever I can do so that I don't have to step out on faith. And his disciples are the same way. Because what's happening on this mountainside is that his disciples are focusing on what they don't have. And that's kind of the next big idea that we have here is that uh, an attitude of scarcity carries with it at its root an issue of unbelief. They were in the middle of nowhere. They had seen Jesus do great things already. But it never even dawned on them that Jesus would do something about this. Because they were focused on what they did not have. You know, in, in Scripture, this is not the only time that Jesus fed a group of people. As a matter of fact, in Mark 8, there's another 4,000 people that get fed. And, and it's interesting, they go through the very same cycle. All these people are out there, they're all hungry, and the disciples say, we don't have enough to feed them. And Jesus responds to him in, in Mark 8, 17 through 21 is this. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? Do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for 5,000 and how many baskets full of broken pieces you picked up? And they said to him, 12, and, and when I broke the seven for the 400, how many large baskets full of pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, seven. And he was saying, do you not yet understand? You see, they had a problem. They had the same problem that we have sometimes when it comes to walking in faith. And that was this. They were focused on what they didn't have. You see, these, these disciples, and once again, they had seen Jesus act time and time and time again, yet they still continued to focus on the scarcity. If they couldn't figure it out in their mind and they couldn't plan it out with their resources, it wasn't possible. However, Jesus says, okay, you've told me what you don't have. Now go tell me what you have. You remember back in, in Mark 6 where he says, what do you have? What do you have? And, and they go and they find five loaves and they find two fishes. Now, to the disciples, they had five loaves and two fishes and 5,000 people. To Jesus, they had five loaves and two fishes and a whole lot of God. See, so that's the difference. Rather than focusing on scarcity, Jesus says, okay, what do you have? Well, I, I don't have a lot, but do you have me? Have you forgotten me, the big God who acts in big ways to do big things? That when we tell stories about it, they're big stories about a big God who acts in big ways to do big things? Have you forgotten and so many times we really do forget. The disciples focused on lack, and Jesus focuses on what they have. And what they have is a whole lot of him. You know, we have a lot of stories in, in this book, the Bible, that we read. And, and they are stories of a big God who acts in big ways, does big things. But, you know, that's not the only stories we have. 
probably in this room, there are people in this room that could tell you a story about them or someone in their family where a big God has acted in a big way to do big things. We have thousands of years of stories since this Bible had stopped being uh, revealed to us and started being compiled. We have thousands of years of stories of a big God doing big things in big ways. And yet, many times we're just like the disciples. We've seen this and we've heard this and we know what's going on, but for some reason that's not our first response. Our first response is to think scarcity. And God says, your first response is to be expectant. Expect me to act because I'm a big God who does big things in big ways. And when we get to the climax of the story, most of you have read this and you know what I'm about to read, but we get to this climax in verse 39 through 44. It says, And he commanded them all to sit down by groups in the green grass, and they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, And he took the five loaves and the the two fish, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves and kept giving them to the disciples to set before them. And he divided up the two fish among them all, and he ate, or they ate, and they were satisfied. Remember that word, they were satisfied. And they picked up 12 full baskets of the broken pieces along with uh, with the fish, and and there were 5,000 men who ate the loaves. Now, some people look at this and say, well, there's 5,000 men. They didn't count anybody but men. So how many people were there? Well, there's probably about 10,000 people. I'm just going to go with 5,000. That's good enough for the story. I don't need to add to it. But do you see what he did? Most people, this escapes their, their uh, notice. He, he tells them, what do you have? They tell him what he has. And he said, well, tell everybody to sit in big circles, hundreds and fifties. There was another place they would do this. This is what they would do at a wedding feast. When they would have a feast like Jesus, the same feast that Jesus turned water into wine in John chapter 2 at Cana of Galilee, more than likely at this wedding feast, they were sitting in circles of hundreds and fifties, and they were all on the grass, and they were expecting a feast. So basically he was saying, let them sit in a pattern that says, we're about to have a big dinner. Now, once again, he's got five loaves and two fishes. And it tells us that he continued to take the loaves, he continued to take the fishes, they continued to eat, and they were satisfied. Now, I I wondered, because some versions say they were full, and, and I wondered how much food does it take to fill a human being? Have you ever thought about that? Well, I looked it up online, And it was on Google, so it must be true. It takes a pound of food to totally fill the average human being. One pound. Now, I want you to think about this, because I know there's engineers in the room, and you're sitting there saying, now, wait a minute, a pound of food, 5,000 people. That's two and a half tons of food. That's a bunch of food, isn't it? It wasn't two and a half tons of food. It was more. They didn't have 12 baskets of food to start with, and they walked away with 12 baskets left over, and everybody was full. Why? Because our God is an extravagant God. He doesn't just give us what we need. When he leads us out into the wilderness, and he's preparing us for something, he doesn't just give us what he needs. He gives us more than we need. We can be people who are expectant because our God has more than we're ever going to need. I don't know who you are, and if you're like me, you've probably done this. Anybody here ever tried to make a deal with God? You go into these negotiations. I won't ask you to raise your hand because it gets embarrassing, right? But you go into these, you know, God, I just need this. If I can only get this, I'll give you this. You ever done that? I'm here to tell you this morning that if you're negotiating with God, you will always leave something on the table because he's got more to give you than you've got to ask for. That God is an extravagant God that sets you up in this wilderness, wherever you are in this wilderness, for a feast. And he's ready to rain down and pour down blessing in your life because he's preparing you for something greater than what you're doing right now. That's kind of the next big idea. The, the next big idea simply is that, uh, uh, 
God's provision is, is extravagant, even though much of it can be present yet unseen. Once again, they were on the mountainside and they saw five loaves and two fishes, but there was more there than they thought because his provision is present. Just sometimes we just don't see it. For all of you who leave things on the table, I have a verse of scripture I want to share with you this morning. It's in Ephesians 3, and if you've been here more than three days, you've probably heard me say this. It's Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 tells us this. It's now to him who is able to do far abundantly, or far more abundantly beyond all we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And what, what Paul is trying to tell the church at Ephesus is what I'm trying to tell you today. God can do more than our wildest imaginations. I don't know what season you're in. I don't know if you're in the wilderness or if you're just going into the wilderness or you're just coming out of a wilderness or maybe you're back in the city, but very seldom does God's provision happen in the city where we're comfortable and we're safe. It's always where he takes us out on that ledge. And wherever you are, I just want to let you know that whatever your imagination is of what will fix your situation, he can do more than that. Church, whatever your imagination is that this church can do, and you're going to negotiate with God based on what you see and what you know, I can tell you that he's got more planned for this church than our imaginations can hold. He's got more planned for your life than your imaginations can hold. Why? Because he is a big God who does big things in big ways. You know, the great crime of Christianity is not that we ask too much. It's that we ask too little and expect nothing. That's the great crime of Christianity. Oh, you've got these people who have, who have ruined the idea of asking God for things and God de- delivering things because they've taken it to the, the levels of absurdity. But the great crime of Christianity is that we just don't ask for enough. And we expect even less. And God wants you to know this morning that he's a big God who does big things in big ways. And whatever you're dealing with or wherever you are in this life, whatever's going on, he can deal with that. Because as Jake said this morning, this world may seem big, but God's even bigger. Your problems may seem big, but God's even bigger. The scarcity that you see, God is even bigger bigger and so your homework assignment this morning is this where is it in your life imagine what you can do with your scarcity and then ask to receive his provision his way where is it in your life that you're finding scarcity where is it in your life that you feel like you don't have enough find out what that is Imagine the solution and then ask God for more. Because he leads us to the wilderness to build us back better. He leads us to the wilderness so that we, when we see scarcity, we see we can find provision. And he leads us to the wilderness to tell us, I'm an extravagant God. I'm a big God who does big things in big ways. So ask. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this morning. We pray that uh, we'll be people who ask, that we'll strengthen one another in, the, in, in sharing the responses that you give us to the things that are going on in our lives. We know that you're an amazing God. And forgive us when we don't ask. Forgive us when we don't see. Forgive us when we don't believe. Forgive us when we don't trust you. Forgive us when when we think things are too big for us and for some reason we think they're too big for you too because they are not. We thank you for salvation, the biggest gift. We thank you that when this world ends, you're going to take us home, the biggest gift, to a place that's more amazing than our wildest imaginations. Thank you for trading places with us on that cross so that we can live forever with you someday. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.